Hey, Christine. Hey, what? So I saw this shirt that I think you'd really like. <gasps> Did you buy it for me? No, actually, I'm lying. There's two shirts I thought you'd really like. Oh, my. There was one that was the little prince that reminded me of your tattoo. Wait, for real? Yeah, it has. I'm not kidding. It's the uh, elephant <gasps> picture on That's your arm. That's my tattoo. Yeah. Oh, my God. And then there's another one that says, ask me about my dog. Oh, please do. I Well, I didn't know if I should get it for you or for me because she has <laughs> basically both of our children. Where did you find that? I saw it on Mod Cloth. Oh, I love Mod Cloth. It's really nice. I'm a huge Mod Cloth fan. I don't know if you guys know this, but Mod Cloth is your go-to spot for fashion as unique as you and as unique as me, which is very unique. <laughs> One thing I really like about Mod Cloth is that you can be really any size and mm-hmm. they've got whatever, anything you can find on there, they have it in your size. They go from double X small all the way down to 4XL. Which is awesome. They specialize also in a broad range of styles. So they have like quirky statement prints, vibrant colors. Apparently they have little prints clothes, which is amazing. Mm-hmm. Retro dresses, classic silhouettes, cool contemporary clothing. Honestly, anything that like fits your style, they probably have. Not only are you able to fit in just about any size, but they can also give you free sizing and they'll also help fit you with a styling help I guess they have a team of mod stylists over there that will make sure that you look good in whatever you buy. I need all the help I can get. Did you know that there's also a Letterman jacket with a Ouija board on the back? Oh, my God. So I don't know why we don't have that. One of our listeners sent us that a while back, and I've been eyeing it ever since. We shouldn't have team team jackets. Team, oh, my gosh. Team Ouija board jackets. And it's perfect for the fall coming up because Halloween. True, true. So Halloween cooler weather trying to transition into some some new wardrobe get yourself a ouija board it's really cool jacket uh so if you want to check any of this out uh go to modcloth.com that's modcloth.com uh enter promo code drink at checkout and you'll get 30 percent off your order of a hundred dollars or more which is a big chunk of cash yeah it's a big chunk of cash but their clothes are so nice and there's such a variety check it out go look at the, the ouija board jacket it's fucking amazing <laughs> go ask us about our dog go ask us about our Via dog mod cloth shirt and my tattoo <laughs> <laughs> this is all about me uh <laughs> make everyday extraordinary at mod cloth hello lisa hello. oh my god hello is it working is it working <laughs> Do you hear me? We hear you. Do you hear us okay? Yes, or I wouldn't be able to answer that question. Okay, guys, uh, as we promised, we've got the one and only Lisa Lampanelli with us here today. Right, Em? Yes, we have her, yes. Are you excited? We have her right here. Uh, Her new podcast called Get Stuffed uh, is premiering soon, and we're super excited to have her on with us. And uh, Lisa, if you want to tell us a little bit about your podcast, uh, you can go ahead and do that. Yes, I'm very excited. First of all, I'd like to say hello to Christine and Em. Hello! for Hello. For people who don't know this, the reason Christine allowed me on the show was because she happens to be engaged to my nephew (laughs) and I strong armed her into this booking because I mean, now that they have so many downloads, I'm not as much of a big shot as they thought I was. I like and, how you say we allowed you on the podcast. We have very strict rules about yeah, like who's you, allowed. You uh, wrote in and we were like, mm, we'll pencil Lisa Lampanelli we'll, in. We'll yes. pencil you oh, in. Oh, <laughs> well, you know what's funny, though? Because when I decided to do a podcast, because I was like, okay, I, I want to quit calling into shows like to promote myself to the press and everything. I can't take it. And then they told me, well, you should do podcasts because the podcasting community is sort of insular and you should promote your new podcast on other podcasts and they go find ones that have downloads of over a hundred thousand. <laughs> so I said, okay. So I reached out to you guys <laughs> at your, whatever the hell this thing is called podcast. <laughs> and I was like, you know, even though they're kind of losers with the dream, I'm going to go on. And then I find out you have like tons of downloads. So I'm like, oh my God. And I want to tell you in advance, just to toot your horn a little bit, while I've never listened to the podcast, just because I'm really busy and important, (laughs) I do indeed have a t-shirt of yours that I wore in an upcoming episode of Comedy Central's Taskmaster. So I think that's pretty fucking supportive. I I think you're a number one aunt-in-law. 
that was the biggest deal. Yeah, Christine ever. told me that you were wearing it on the show, and I lost my mind. I was pretty excited. It's, so it's a pretty big thank deal. you for yeah. helping us. No, but but you guys are nailing it. I'm super proud of you. And I always say like this, you know, if you have a dream, you go after it. And you didn't obviously go after it for the money. You went after it out of love. And look, it took off. So this is what I'm trying to teach people on my podcast. Stuff. <laughs> <laughs> With Lisa Lampanelli, which premiered this week yeah. to brave reviews. And I will tell you this. Let me tell you something. These people who ask my advice, I only like it if they listen to me and do what I say. <laughs> so for an hour a week to these people, me and my guest co-host, Mike Morse, we give advice. Well, pretty much I give the advice because what the fuck does Mike know? He oh, works yeah. for free, you know, come on. <laughs> He's the unpaid intern. Yes, basically that's it. Now, I hear on this show of yours, this little podcast, if you will, that you talk about what makes one drink. Is that your situation? That is what we that's do. It. Yes. Yeah, we that's the whole thing. That's literally the entire point. It's the entire point of our lives. So we decided we would just start recording it mm -hmm. and let other people live in our misery. I like this idea very much because, see, now, as you can tell, uh, and as people know from my journey of weight loss and weight struggles, while well, you say, and that's why we drink, mine, of course, is, and that's why I eat. Of course. Because I always use food to medicate. I'm trying not to anymore, but it's very difficult. So I hear I'm supposed to tell why I was tempted to eat this week. Shall I vent? I Please would, do. That's all we want. Please go. Listen, I'm letting you in on a new project I'm doing. Uh -huh. Not only I play stuffed. What I'm also working on is a very terrific musical. Now, I'm a very, I'm like the Lin-Manuel Miranda if he was white. <laughs> Just the same, one and the same, really. <laughs> exactly. And I am writing a comedy musical called Rape Kit the Musical. <laughs> what? Now, this stemmed from the fact that Mariska Hargitay has a foundation and she made a documentary <laughs> that there's many rape kits, many, many rape kits that have gone untested. And a lot of these rapers are running around raping willy nilly. <laughs> so I said, well, this sounds like a hilarious comedy concept to me. I think a musical is appropriate. Well, yesterday when I get home, I was going to take a whole day and watch my favorite show to take notes, which, of course, is Law & Order Special Rape Show, which is on every day, all day on USA, and sometimes on I on Positively Television, if you're lucky. Right, of course. Featuring Elliot Stabler. Okay. Of course. Oh, my God. The sexiest man alive. So I would sexy. let him, For reals. So I get home ready to take notes from Mariska. All of a sudden, I turn on the USA they're showing NCIS! <laughs> How am show. I supposed to write my big musical opening number to Rape Kit without a Law & Order marathon? Well, I got to say, right then, I almost cracked up in the freaking power bars. And I don't mean the good <laughs> ones. I mean the Snickers ones, okay? <laughs> so you know what I did instead? I said, Lisa, are you going to let this rape show make you fat? And I said, no, you are not. So you know what I did? I went to sleep instead and got nothing done. That's what you have to do. <laughs> you get your, you get depressed and then you go to sleep. Exactly. So see, even my whole life worked out yesterday. I did not allow it to let me eat. But doesn't that what happened? What happens to you guys? What makes you drink slash eat slash uh, bang indiscriminate people? <laughs> Let's take our pick, Em. This week I drank for a good reason, which is my girlfriend now lives in L.A., so there's no more long distance. But I was drinking because I was in a long distance relationship for a long time. By the way, how is it having the girlfriend live in the area? It's awesome so far. She Okay, listen, she made us, and when I say us, I mean Em, me, Alexander, and Blaze. She made us fettuccine Alfredo with chicken and asparagus tonight. Yeah, right before we called you. See, who's feeding me? Nobody. <laughs> well, Em thought you were here in town. I really thought I was going to get to see you again. And I got here and I was like, where's Lisa? And Christine was like, oh, she's she's on the East Coast. And I was like, well, what the <laughs> fuck? I thought we were having a whole interview with her today. Well, I got to be honest, I would have stayed. But as you know, I'm very famous, very important. I uh, started rehearsals today for my play Stuffed. And I tell you what, 
It's terrific. So I don't have time for the likes of you except after hours. So you're welcome. Thank you. Well, that's true because every time I've seen you, it has been after hours. You took us to House of Pies at one in the morning one time. <laughs> Listen, I'm a nice person. No one would guess Lisa Lampanelli has a heart of gold and goes to see her niece-in-law do this uh, improv, as you call it. <laughs> Nobody guessed that I'm a, a very nice person. I, I'm, pretty, hey. I'm pretty sure you did text her right before she went on the stage, though, and said, don't suck. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, a, that's an old comedy trick. <laughs> then you have it in your head, you're going to suck, and then you never do. You try harder. I know all the tricks. Would I be this famous in calling you guys on this high-selling podcast? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> now, listen to me. You know how my podcast is fantastic and interesting? Oh, yeah, I know all about that. Yes, get stuffed on iTunes, feralaudio.com. I want to say this. What I like about your podcast, from what I hear, you talk about these crime stories and these ghost stories. Now, crime is very interesting to me, as you know, by my history with Law & Order Special Rape Show. Oh, sure. Now, know I joke, of course. I seem to be making rape-heavy comments, so I want to apologize. You can cut a few of them out because I have a feeling you're <laughs> female listenership, if they don't know who I am, think I think lightly of this subject, which I don't. But um, <laughs> let me get in on some of this action. I want to hear about this paranormal thing because I don't believe in any of it. I so I that. think you really know what my reaction is. So hit us with your paranormal story. I knew coming into this that I was going to get a lot of shit from you, Lisa, because I think the first thing you ever said to me was, so you're the one that runs the bullshit part of the podcast. <laughs> yeah, I think that was an exact quote. I'm, I'm actually very impressed that you remembered the oh. exact quote. Very good. Well, I was I was actually a, a fan of yours. I am a fan of yours. Jesus, that was fucking rude. <laughs> but uh, I was a fan of yours growing up, and I was like, I wonder if I ever met like one of my like favorite comics. What would they say to me? And you broke the mold. That's that's what you said. Spot so. on. Spot on. So thanks for that memory. I'm, I'm happy I could make a dream come true. <laughs> Yay. Okay, so um, my story is a haunted asylum this week called oh. the Rolling Hills Asylum in New York. Mm. And uh, usually what I do is give a little history first, and then I tell all about the different uh, haunting experiences that have happened. And you're more than welcome to jump in and say your piece. I'm sure you've got a lot of opinions about all the shit I'm about to say. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say thanks for giving me that permission that I didn't need. <laughs> Okay, so um, so it, it's located between Buffalo and Rochester in a town called East Bethany. And mm -hmm. it started as a carriage house in a stagecoach tavern in the 1700s. And around the 1820s, uh, there was a mandate in New York that said all counties were charged to now have to take care of the poor. And so they had to find property to house all of these people. Uh, and around 1826, 1827... The county purchased this property and called it the County Poor Farm. Oh, that's kind of rude. Well, it was a poor house, and it was just a place to keep people who couldn't fend for themselves, essentially. So in the 1800s, their uh, welcoming brochure allowed these people as followed. Habitual drunkards. So Christine's already there. So me. I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> um, lunatics. So Lisa's there. So Lisa's hey. there. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Debtors, the chronically ill. Poppers, who were just people who have no income at all, so almost so, me. So us too, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, people who are blind or old or disabled and vagrants. Wow. So, so we're all screwed back then. We're all then. screwed, especially because in the 1820s, vagrants included uh, single women and children. What? Because at the time, they couldn't own their own land. Oh, Lisa. So uh -oh. all single I'm women. In. I'm in. <laughs> so get this. It also became uh, an orphanage at the same time that it was becoming a sanitarium. Oh, so Lisa, there's also a bunch of children there. <laughs> a bunch of poor Ooh. homeless children. <laughs> well, as you know how much I love them. Oh, <laughs> ma, on a me. All right. So uh, orphans were brought there to remove them from the town streets because they were being beggars. Sure. Um, so they took orphans in, they took single women in, and then everyone on the list. So by the late 1940s, it was a sanitarium, an orphanage, and a tuberculosis ward. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> you, know what it, you know what? This is literally, now that you said tuberculosis, Oliver. Yes. The 
musical Oliver because that bitch Nancy died of TB, I <laughs> yeah. believe. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And now I, I will reenact for you <laughs> a a few lines from Oliver. Please do. Oh, damn it. Guess what? I was about to do Annie. I got my orphans oh, mixed up. Oh, come on. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do a little Annie. Here we go. It's a hard knock life for us. It's a hard knock life for us. Me, 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 molesting us. That's it. <laughs> Were you just waiting for a re- an excuse to sing Annie on, on air? What's weird? Every time I hear the word or- orphan, I think it's a hard knock life. I think it's just a gift I have and everybody wishes they were me right now. Definitely a gift for sure. I also think that it definitely would be an interesting sequel for it to not just be orphans, but also like tuberculosis patients and vagrants and homeless people right. all at one time, just singing about how hard their life is. Right. All at once. I totally agree because being an orphan now is like pretty common and normal. Like nobody cares, <laughs> but you have a TB orphan who's blind and a vagrant. <laughs> you have buy that book. And a vagrant. <laughs> <laughs> vagrant i love that and also i do love that single women were considered like non-earners and they had to go in there they couldn't own their own land it's so sad well it gets it gets worse guys oh good oh, so, go ahead. uh so despite their reason for being there they were all called inmates mm. and mm. uh they were i guess to live there they needed to work to help feed the poor house so they either raised animals grew food they would can bake or work in the wood shop where they primarily built coffins for themselves what oh what the fuck yeah wow uh, yeah that's bad that's that's, bad. that's like pushing a new limit here that's like uh preparing for the ultimate your ultimate gift wow. is a coffin that's, made by you that's rough and well uh, what's ironic is those tuberculosis people were coffin <laughs> Oh my their, god. On their way to the coffin. They're... Hello, is this thing on? <laughs> we just muted you. Sorry for that 30 seconds. <laughs> so well, many of the patients there spent their entire lives there, including one woman who I think had the record. She lived there uh, in the asylum for over 70 years <gasps> from age 9 to 80. No. Yeah. So another uh, guy that lived there, uh, his name was Roy. And he has been living, he had been living in the asylum since he was 12. He had, uh, was it gigantism? Gigant- oh. Gigantism? Isn't it elf? Does that mean his nutsack was really big? Yes. It was, like, he... <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Lisa. Wow. I'm guessing proportionally, yes. Isn't it called elephantitis? No, elephantitis is when a, one part of you is, like, such a large tumor, it, like, it's crazy. Oh, so this is just his ball sack? No, no, no. Oh. Everyone <laughs> calm down. <laughs> <laughs> Never so mind. he was just a, he was a giant he was literally a giant he grew uh, up to be almost eight feet tall like andre the giant yes okay yes um and so his father who was a prominent banker in the town was so embarrassed by him that they sent roy to live no. in the orphanage slash asylum and so it was kind of like he was a big giant elephant man yes exactly Probably with. I am not an animal. Yes. <laughs> so sad. He also was known to have bulging, exaggerated facial features and oversized hands and feet. So I'm assuming his testicles were about the same. And ah. he <laughs> he grew to the height of, of almost eight feet. Oh my god. Um, the only thing I could find about him was that he was really kind and friendly and loved opera music. But he also cried himself to sleep every night because his parents <gasps> left him because he was so big. What the fuck? That's so sad. Like, it don't, totally, like, when I used to watch The Elephant Man, yeah. I used to always cry. I thought it was so sad because it's like, my God, he's he's just in this body he doesn't want to be in. And then I got really overweight and before I'm, like, the beautiful, skinny person I am now. Sure. And I was like fuck it, I'd rather be the elephant man than fat. At least people don't give give you the elephant man a dirty look when he's walking down the aisle of a goddamn airplane to sit next to them. <laughs> on, the, on the flip side, though, since we were just talking about one man's enlarged balls, have you heard about this guy who has the world's largest penis? And it's like, what? Like, the world's largest for humans. But his is, like, before hard, he's, like, 14 inches long. No! Yes. That's not possible. That's, that's just a waste. Let me tell you something. <laughs> That's horrible. He he's it's like any more than seven inches is a waste in my humble opinion. 
it's just like it's not necessary. And by the way, that's hurtful to people. And by people, I mean women that he's going to have sex with. That's well, my thought. He, there's like a documentary about him. And apparently a bunch of women would go on dates with him until they saw the size and would leave him. Like they yeah. couldn't handle it. Oh, no. Oh, obviously they couldn't handle it. Wait, so how big? OK, sorry to be like whatever. But how big is it when it's I, I don't know, but I'm guessing at several I, feet I, I, <laughs> like a meter a yardstick i don't know holy they sh- called him you know what his nickname was the <laughs> the human tripod yes that's <laughs> precisely the title of the documentary actually oh wow lisa <laughs> it was kicks st- he it was like a kickstand so these quote inmates uh they were also uh led under a nurse named nurse emmy e-m-m-i-e and she was allegedly involved in the dark arts and sold the orphans into uh, satanic cults. What? And also used them in black magic sacrifices because they Good. were orphans. No one, no one cared, I guess. Oh, no. And uh, patients were regularly chained to walls, given uh, mind-altering drugs to calm them down. They were lobotomized. They had ice baths. They were electric shocked. And eventually, to keep the incredibly unsafe patients away from the general population, they put them in their own solitary confinement cells, which always does so much better for people. Such a good idea. There are still iron brackets protruding from the cement walls because they used to shackle the inmates for any reason at all, um, including Alzheimer's, epilepsy, Tourette's, which I actually have, so I would definitely be shackled up. You'd be shackled up, yep. Uh, Or just being an unruly wife. So back then, apparently a guy... (laughs) A guy could tell his wife, I'm going to lock you up and actually take them to the asylum and lock them up for a certain amount of days until they were more obedient. Oh, no. What do you have to say about that, Lisa? I mean, in the guy's defense, women can be really annoying. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So hang on. It gets worse. So in the... (laughs) In the main kitchen in the basement, animals were slaughtered and butchered on site there. And during the tuberculosis epidemic, uh, when the morgue was full, bodies would get put into the meat freezers with the animals. And <laughs> Oh, God! And it said that a lot of the nearly dead patients would get put in the freezer just to die faster. What? Because they just wanted them out of the way and would just put them in there while they were still alive. What the fuck? Um, over 1,700 documented deaths happened on this property throughout its time. Oh, my. And most of them are buried under the property now in unmarked graves because there used to be a cemetery and the location has just gotten lost. Oh. Throughout time. Good. Um, so it reopened as an antique mall for a couple years. And by 2007, it's now just a haunted house that a couple happens to live in and they give ghost tours and... Um, there's actually six six different types of tours. They range between an hour and eight hours. So you can actually do a whole night lockdown and do all your own investigating. Uh, but that's the history of it. So now I've just got some, some Some ghosts, some bullshit, according to Lisa. (laughs) Yes, please hit us with your bullshit lies. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, the typical stuff would happen where doors and windows would, you know, close and open on their own, or they would lock people in or stick shut on either way. So, People would get trapped in the rooms. Um, Hair and clothes would get tugged. People would feel cold hands touching their neck. And then uh, a lot of people have been reporting that they hear screams and sobs from the part of the building that used to, that was once on fire and burnt all the way down. And about 30 of the patients died in that part of the building. Oh, no. Um, There's a black mist that can be found uh, floating behind you if you're walking uh, in the middle of the night. Ew. There is a, I guess there was a barber room, a barber shop in here Mm -hmm. where the TB patients and orphans went, I guess. (laughs) And the (laughs) male visitors who sit in the chair can feel their hair getting touched and cut. Oh, God. Uh, Well, that's good. That's an extra right there. You usually have to pay extra for the massage during the haircut. Yeah, that's a perk. Uh, People in wheelchairs, this is kind of fucked up, but also cool. People in wheelchairs will feel themselves getting rolled down the hallways by... (laughs) By someone that isn't there. <laughs> Which, by the way, finally you get to, like, do it with no hands, you know? Yeah, you just... finally you have a plus for being in a wheelchair. Exactly. So there was uh, one account that I found. I'm just going to read the quote. Uh, this is from one of the investigators in 2007. We had a gentleman with us that was filming a documentary about the building. He wanted to perform an experiment in one of the rooms where he put he turned off all the lights and all the equipment, and the only light that was on was a pink glow stick in the middle of the room. 
We also placed a small ball and a toddler-sized rocking horse in the circle. And the gentleman conducted the experiment requesting that only I talk to the spirits and try to make contact with them. The glow stick started to move back and forth by itself and the rocking horse began to slowly rock. A few of the guests in the room, including myself, saw a hand and an arm come out of nowhere and reach for the ball and then vanish into, into air. Oh, no. So there's that. Yep. Now, Christine, are you buying any of this? Listen, I, the reason I, no offense, Em, but the reason I befriended Em initially <laughs> is because I was like, tell me everything about your paranormal experiences because <laughs> right. I a thousand percent buy into it and Blaze doesn't. So nobody else will, t- and neither does my brother. So nobody else will talk with me about it. So Em is really like my go-to for this kind of stuff. My icebreaker when I met Christine, when we all had to awkwardly make friends with each other Mm -hmm. was that I was a paranormal investigator because that's just one that people remember. Oh, the moment she said that, I was like, I'm in. Yeah, she was like, oh, we're best friends now. Okay. (laughs) Uh, So I told her that, and then as soon as we got out here to L.A. and we didn't know anyone, we had nothing but... And we didn't have jobs either. So nope, nope. nope. We had nothing to do but talk. And I ended up telling her all these stories and yep, hooked her in. Beginning of the end, people. Wow, because you know what? I think it's great that you do believe this stuff or else this podcast would end badly every week. Oh yeah. <laughs> be, like you both telling each other you're full of shit and hanging up the phone and just being mean. And then no fettuccine Alfredo for anybody. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. We're just here for the fettuccine Alfredo for being honest. <laughs> sure. So, uh, women are told to avoid the old smoking room oh. because apparently there's a presence in there that likes to grab women's breasts. Why did you want to avoid that? <laughs> Lisa's like, sign me up. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. My intern is coming to refill my wine glass. Thank you. Thank you. Get, get with it, Allison. God, she is like a gem and a half. She's so attentive. So attentive. I think I'm going to date her. Um, I might date her too. Just, okay. Just so you know. Okay. Anyway, go on. So uh, on the second floor, there are footsteps and equipment, the sound of equipment moving um, that can be heard from above, but there's actually no third floor. So it was almost like a, a false floor that you can hear sounds Ew. all night. Um, one person said that their neck was burning, and when their wife checked their neck, it was bright red and had scratch marks through it. Oh. Which I'm sure skeptics out there could say he just scratched his own neck for attention. Who knows? Or maybe he had on, like, Biofreeze or Ben Gay. <laughs> yeah, ben you know Gay. what? That's true. I actually just had to stop using a deodorant because it was giving me chemical burns. Exactly. So... You're probably maybe you're right. See that? <laughs> Lisa is just like debunking, debunking the shit out of me. Everything. <laughs> so Roy, Alan, and I'm a very realistic person. Although, may I just say one thing What's before that? I forget? What's that? I once yelled the. I'm so scary when I'm mad that I scared the devil out of my mother's house. What happened? I was always convinced because I used to, as a kid, watch this soap opera about the occult called Dark Shadows. And it was about this vampire, Barnabas Jones. And so it was really scary. So I got all scared all the time, every time my parents would leave the house. (laughs) One day it was night and I was like 17 years old. And I was so scared because everybody was out except me. And I heard creaking. And Christine probably doesn't know this because I don't yell in front of her. But (laughs) oh my God. I was like, that's the devil, you know, because I had just watched, oh, I think, no. like Damien Omen 3 or some shit. So <laughs> I looked at that freaking, where that squeak was coming from, and I yelled, oh, really, devil? <laughs> you can get the fuck out of here. You don't, I don't believe your shit for a minute. Like, I was gangster with the devil. <laughs> fucking stop squeaking i so scary i scared the devil out of the house maybe i do believe in the devil and i yelled at him and now i'm fucking supreme dude maybe, maybe the devil believes in you and just knows to get the fuck out <laughs> that's true that's true i swear to god i felt pretty proud of myself that i'm that scary you are just too powerful to be even infiltrated by this kind of stuff i guess i think it's also a little bit of like the new york accent that you've got going on yeah yeah, yeah that helps that, that, that's true that that's true. That'll people. scare anybody. Maybe I went like all Sopranos on his ass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my Gangsta. dad, my dad has a New York accent. He grew up in Long Island, and he, uh, when he gets mad, it really comes out, and that's just when you know you just might as well kill yourself. It's just the, the worst experience. You're a goner, yeah. Oh yeah. 
So, okay, last thing. Last couple things. So, Roy, the friendly giant. Aw. He apparently still haunts the whole east wing, and you can hear him crying, and you can still hear opera music. Oh, good. Supposedly. Uh, also, there is a there was a whole blind ward where all of the blind people, I guess, oh, no. to make sure that uh, nurses, they could get the attention for nurses, they would shout help and hello anytime they heard a sound at all. Oh, no. Uh, just because they didn't know if that could possibly be a nurse walking That's by. so sad. So if you ever make a lot of noise by the blind ward, you can hear someone say hello, and they've gotten tape recordings oh, of no. a random voice saying hello. Oh, no. Uh, there's also an experience with Roy the Friendly Giant where I guess the current owner found a rat in the infirmary and got scared and ran away. When she came back later, the rat was, uh, his neck had been snapped, and there was nice. a giant bloody handprint next to it, and they think it was, she likes to think it was Roy, like, protecting her from the rat. Oh, Roy! Uh, the Roy's r- a good guy, you know? I wish he was single, and so am I, you know? <laughs> <laughs> So on the second floor, uh, there's an area called the shadow hallway because apparently there's just crazy shadows in the middle of the night that will either follow you or they'll peek around the corner and then when you look, they'll go away. And there's one quote that really freaked me out from the current owner that says, in the shadow hallway, this is where we see a lot of shadow people. We look down the infirmary section and you see... uh, Shadow people that look just like us except they're solid black. Sometimes they're pitch gray, some... Uh, sometimes they're dark gray or pitch black and they come in out of doorways, walk across the hall and sometimes they'll poke an arm or a leg out and even crawl on the floor to you, no which thanks. can be especially creepy if you're sitting on the floor during an investigation. They're crawling toward and you? And they're crawling towards you, like crab walking towards you. No, thank you. <laughs> so whether wow. or not that's real, that's at least a nightmare from hell. It sounds like a horror movie. Also in the morgue, uh, there are walk-in refrigerators where they used to store the human corpses. Oh, sure. And people have supposedly been pushed in there and the doors have locked on them. You can also hear children running throughout the building and they, these ghost children, uh, also sense when people that are on the tours are parents, they will cling to them and the people that are parents on the tour will hear kids singing nursery rhymes to them and some really creepy shit. Ooh. Um, I mean, there's nothing worse than a needy kid, you know? <laughs> You're like, that's what's horrifying about this whole story. Well, people will... Re- really, that's the worst part, is that some kid's <laughs> clinging to your leg. <laughs> well, people will record themselves singing, like a nursery rhyme, and if you stop singing halfway through, the tape recorder will pick up a little kid finishing the song. No, thank supposedly. you. No, thank you. And then the last thing I have to say, which I think you'll get a kick out of, Lisa, is that down in the butcher shop, you can still smell raw meat, and an old man... You'll hear an old man's voice laugh if you ever uh, tell a dirty joke. <laughs> oh, my God. Wait, if I can get free meat and a laugh, <laughs> I move into this weird town of whatever the F it's I mean, called. Lisa, you fit all of the requirements to move in. So I feel well, like I'm mean, just like a lunatic. Yeah. What, all the all the single woman, single, single woman. woman. You've got you've got big ball Roy. You've yeah. Got, just got to move right in. Mm-hmm. Get some meat. Sure. I think I've just learned a lot. And I've got to say, having no faith in either one of you, (laughs) I must say I now have faith in the podcast because I say this is informative. I found a new place that I need to buy property. (laughs) I'm going to go spend eight hours in this crazy effing asylum. We're basically a real estate agent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just love this. I really think you guys have educated and informed even me, Lisa Lampanelli. Lisa, Aww. you're welcome. <laughs> yes, thank you. Now listen to me. I'm going to say one last thing. I'm very famous and important. So <laughs> Christine's wine just came out of her nose, by I the way. I just spit my wine out. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm very important. So I have to go. And I want to say this. I want to thank you for having me as a guest. Sure, I felt like I was doing you the favor. Oh, now I feel I've still done you a bigger favor. <laughs> <laughs> I've stayed on longer than necessary. I've listened to your cockamamie bullshit story. <laughs> Thank you. That's However, no, want. you guys really did me a solid because I had so much fun with you. I have to say, anyone who just kind of lets me talk and lets me interject, I'm fine with. So I want to say this. Next time I'm in L.A., I'm going to come do the podcast in person. 
I'm going to have your girlfriend cook me a friggin' meal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> looking for me, nobody. And I will say this. I'm going to shamelessly plug my podcast, which premiered last week to Critical Raves. Yeah, baby. Yeah, do it. Get Stuffed with Lisa Lampanelli. We talk about helping people, but not really. We <laughs> more or less make fun of everybody under the guise of me being helpful. So listen to me on iTunes, subscribe now, and Christine, and what do you call other girl? M. I really... M's like, I'm still here. Oh, yeah, you yeah. too, M. <laughs> no, seriously, honestly, I know I joke around, but I couldn't be happier that Christine's coming into my family, and I couldn't be happier to do this podcast. This was actually very fun for me, so thanks a lot, man. You are Aww. so wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so people can find the podcast right on iTunes and or... feralaudio.com. Feralaudio.com? Yes. Yeah, and oh, for information, if you're in New York or the tri-state area, my place Stuffed, which is a vagina monologues pretty much for fat people okay. and people with body image issues, please come by. You'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll feel some tingles down below. Uh <laughs> Tickets can be had at stuffedplay.com. Lisa, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Oh, for are you kidding? Seriously, I love you guys, and I'll see you soon. You're so wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. How do you feel about a light autumn meal? Where to begin? For a whole week. I mean, honestly, I feel great. Here's what's going on. You ready? Oh, tell me everything. I have tried HelloFresh, and it's amazing. I'm going to paint you a picture. Paint me a picture. I show up at home from work. Look at my doorstep, oh my and God. there is an insulated box of all of my food for the entire week. I took the meat option. I did the vegetarian. Okay, so the, it was so good, Christine. I had beef stir fry. Oh, I had mushu pork tacos. Oh my God. These tacos were so good, and they were meant for two people, and I ate all of them. <laughs> That was the other thing. Like, Blaze was so pumped because we had food for both of us. And it was vegetarian, but, like, he loved it. It was amazing. It was really good. And I guess they have two dietitians that actually put all these meals together to make sure that everything's perfect for you. It's in it's incredible. They they make it nutritionally balanced for you. And every meal is less than $10. You'd never get bored because they send you new recipes. Uh, they send step-by-step instructions so you don't need to be, you know... A I'm a mess in the kitchen and they just... I figured it out. Everything was within six steps. And, Christine, I thought your favorite part might be at the bottom, they pair a wine with each of your meals oh um you know me so well <laughs> i got really excited when i saw that they give you options so you can pick whatever you want for the next week so there's about eight different meals they give you i got three and they're all they were all good they also offer a family option so if you're you know more than two people you can uh, order the family option in addition to the light autumn meals that you so intrigued me by at the mm. beginning they're also offering breakfast options now which is oh my god dope yeah because it's so hard to make like a nutritious balanced breakfast when you're just waking up you got to get to work for sure it's amazing if you want hello fresh yourself we actually have a promo code we sure do what might that be for 30 dollars off your first week of hello fresh 30 dollars people yowza visit hellofresh.com enter drink 30 drink three zero Three zero. Thirty dollars, people. Thirty dollars. Off fresh, amazing food. Less than ten dollars a meal. I don't even know what else to convince you guys. I I I mean you can probably press the wine pairing a little more. Oh right. Also there's a wine pairing. Hello fresh, drink thirty. It's awesome. Do it. Alright guys, well I guess Lisa You're not good enough for No. Her. Lisa's heard me talk enough in her lifetime and she knows she has a lifetime left to listen to me talk, so Yeah. So even though Lisa had to go, I'm still here and stuck with you i didn't get to run away like she did so i guess you might as well tell me a story i was gonna thank you but then you said you were stuck so i feel like maybe i'm not <laughs> gonna thank you anymore well i have a hunch that she wanted uh to hear my story just because since the day we met she's been telling me that i'm full of shit so yeah i think it was more she had an axe to grind she was with you like she can't deny definitely. murder happened she was definitely ready to uh to shut you down she's been ready to pounce since since I started seeing her, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. So I'm so glad she's not here to interject during my story because I feel like she has a lot to say because my story, I just want to warn you guys. Oh, God. Oh. I Honestly, you need to warn me, too, because all I've heard this whole night is, M, this story is so fucking creepy and wild and gnarly, so I don't know what's coming either. Listen. And Lisa probably wouldn't know what to do with herself, so. Exactly. I didn't know what was coming until... 
few hours ago when I started this research. <laughs> okay. But I got this suggestion uh, from Andy via email. So remember how I told you about Luca Magnata last week? Yes. So remember how I said that um, he had started rumors online about himself yes. dating uh, Carla Homolka? Yes. So guess who is the subject of our story this week? Lisa Lampanelli. How did you know? Oh, my God. Is it Carla? It's like you can read my mind. It's Carla. Oh, man. Uh, so I got the suggestion from Andy. Like I said, uh, she sent this. She sent the suggestion of Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka. This was a couple. Oh, Lord. So okay. Carla was the wife and Paul was the husband. Really? Hey, it's 2017. You never know. You know, you know what? I was wrong for assuming gender. <laughs> so, okay. I'm just going to jump right into it because this is just, I just don't even know how to. Let's just go. All right. Let's just go. So Paul Bernardo, uh, he was born into a wealthy family, but they had some serious issues. Surprise. Mm. Uh, his father was abusive. He... Uh, and Bernardo's mother had two children before she, the mother, started seeing an ex-boyfriend of hers and got pregnant. Mm -hmm. She had a child who ended up being Paul, who was, a, who was the protagonist of our story. Right. Uh, and he was born on August 27th, 1964. Okay. So apparently Paul's father knew about this affair and, quote, tolerated it. Mm. Um, in 1975, Paul's father fondled a young girl... And was charged with child molestation. And also he sexually abused his own daughter. Oh, no. So their mother grew depressed for some unknown reason. Uh, <laughs> and withdrew from the family and started living in the basement, which is just the saddest sentence I've ever heard in my whole life. But That's the saddest out of 33 episodes of And That's Why We Drink. I mean, I feel like it's the saddest in terms... Let's flip through the transcripts. Oh, wait, our intern hasn't done that. All right. Allison, I get on it. Well, she's asleep. Oh, she's so cute. Look at her dreaming. She is very much your friend, though, because she's literally sleeping with a glass of wine in her I'm head. a little bit worried that glass of wine is going to spill onto her laptop, but we'll see. Oh. Uh, so the two older children were, like, troubled by their parents' abuse and, you know, all that. But apparently Paul, who was the youngest, uh, was not phased at all. Uh, he was always smiling, always laughing. He was super polite. He did well in school. He was in the Boy Scouts. Like, he was the model child, um, which is kind of surprising because I feel like a lot of serial killers, when they were young, like, kind of displayed social issues and things like that. Um, when Paul was 16, his mother revealed to him who his real father was. Oh, my. And that he, didn't trigger anything. No. And no, he did not freak out. No, he totally freaked out. Uh, he began verbally abusing his mother at this point. He called her names like slob. He called her whore, things like that. Um, and when he graduated from high school, he started working for Amway. Do you know what Amway is? I think so. Yeah. Is it, it food stamps? Uh, something? No. What it's, is it? It's sort of like, um, <sighs> I've grown into this obsession about reading about MLMs, which are like, multi-level marketing schemes oh, oh, oh. like pyramid so, oh, it's schemes. a pyramid scheme yeah okay so uh amway kind of run oversees all of these different like pyramid schemes so like um, it's like the it's like the kingpin of pyramid schemes yeah so they they're in charge and like i, I googled amway and it was like vitamins and then it was like you know women's clothing and right, it was it's got whatever a whole bunch of stuff um so amway kind of runs a lot of these uh MLMs, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. um, so he started working for Amway, and he was attracted to them to that company because of the like selling tactics and like the social engagement you had to have to sell. And he and his friends would basically practice sales techniques on women at bars to like practice oh their yeah their pitches, and they got really good at them. Um, and he started soon after that. He started at University of Toronto Scarborough. And by then, he had already developed a lot of dark sexual fantasies. Oh, Lord. He would also really enjoyed humiliating women in public and beating up his girlfriends. Oh, okay. So he's just a great A asshole. <sighs> yeah, he's just a shithead. In October of 1987, Paul met a woman by the name of Carla Homolka. Okay, we know about her. So, don't we? flashback to last week. Uh, they were immediately sexually attracted to one another, but Carla was different from his other girlfriends because she encouraged his sadistic behavior. Eesh. 
and encouraged his acts as the drum roll, please. Scarborough rapist. <gasps> I didn't know that that was linked. So. Oh, no. Shit's out of hand. Uh, Paul Bernardo uh, committed numerous sexual assaults that started escalating in violence as they went on. The assaults were usually on young women uh, that he stalked after they got off the bus at night. That was like his Aww. MO, which is fucking terrifying. Yeah. Um, this was before cell phones, too. So it's like there's no foreign protection. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You know? Yeah. 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 His first rape took place on May 4th, 1987. He raped a 21 year old woman in front of her parents' house <gasps> after following her home. No, like she was so close. She was literally in front of her parents' home. Oh, my God. Uh, the attack lasted more than half an hour. Oh, my God. And it gets so much worse. Why did we do this? Why did you do this? Because it's, I don't know what else to do. <laughs> There's only so many Michael Malloys in the world where it's like... If every episode was about a Michael Malloy... I think we would be famous by now. Absolutely, but how am I supposed to... Michael Malloy was one of a kind for a reason, you know? Also, you look very nice in that shirt, but I, then I remember it's my shirt, and I'm like, ah, oh, that's why you like. That's why it looks so good. I'm wearing M's shirt. Don't tell Allison. Uh, no, Allison has watched you wear it all night. She actually fed you dinner in, while wearing my shirt. <laughs> Allison fed me uh, fettuccine Alfredo while I was wearing M's shirt. <laughs> but also, I'm realizing how much larger I am than you, like taller. Yeah, because you're much taller than me. I knew that, but I didn't know how because you're wearing the shirt and literally without trying, the sleeves just hang right over you. Yeah, they do. Interesting. Okay, so 10 days later, uh, he raped a 19-year-old woman in the backyard of her parents' home. Oh, that's even worse. Actually, then, I don't even know if that's worse because if it's the front of the house, then you would think someone would have driven by. I mean, I feel like it's... Okay, they're both worse. I mean, they're both I don't want to argue which one's worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. The next rape was of a 15-year-old girl, um, and this one lasted an hour. 15 and an hour? <sighs> I know. Uh, and that's when the Toronto police issued a warning to women in Scarborough traveling alone at night, especially by bus. Um, and then when he committed his next rape, which was of a 17-year-old girl, he raped her with the knife he used to threaten his victims. Oh, my God. Oh, wait, he raped her with the knife? Yes. She's arrived. But still. Oh, my God. And this is when he acquired the name Scarborough Rapist. So that's sort of when, like, his serial killer, you know, persona took yeah. took form in the media. And I'm going to be honest, the list of attacks is so long that I can't read all of them. Like, it's really a bullet list of... Oh, my God. It's a ton. So I'm just going to kind of go through the ones that stood out to me. Do you have, like, um, a number at the end? No, because... It's kind of unclear. He confessed to, I think, 12 and then later con confessed to 10 more while he was already in prison. So nobody knows, like, oh, shit, really okay. how many, you know, right, right, right. But there are a, there was an entire section on Wikipedia of like um, potential victims or like assumed victims. Right. That weren't, you know, ch he wasn't technically charged with. Um, okay, so I'm going to give you an idea of how things escalated. So on October 4th, 1988, uh, Paul attempted to rape a woman, but she fought him off and he managed to stab her in the thigh and buttocks, which ended up requiring 12 stitches, but she was okay after okay. that. Okay. Um, and that's when the Metro police in Toronto perform, uh, performed, uh, formed a special task force with the intent of catching him. So they created this whole like police force to catch him. On August 15th, 1989, Bernardo committed his eighth rape against a 22-year-old woman. Um, this is really fucked up. He had stalked her the previous night from outside the window of her apartment and then waited uh, for her to arrive home the next day. Oh, my God. And the attack lasted two hours. Oh, my God. I know. <laughs> um, then after that, he raped a 15-year-old. Uh, it was a few months later. And after that... Uh, his 10th rape was in the stairwell of an underground parking lot. On May 26, 1990, Bernardo committed his 11th rape, which lasted over an hour. Um, the victim, who was 19 years old at the time, was able to give police a vivid description of what the attacker looked like. So they were able to release a computer composite photograph right. to the public. So that was kind of a big deal. 
Um, so in July of 1990, more than three years after the string of rapes began. So this is literally the things I listed. It was only a portion of the list that was oh my God. on online. And that was like the confirmed ones. That wasn't even like the, the suggested exactly, alleged ones. Alleged ones. Um, so over three years later, uh, Paul Bernardo was taken in for questioning by police the interview lasted 35 minutes, and Bernardo voluntarily gave them DNA samples. They asked him why he thought he was brought in for questioning, and he said he admitted he seemed to resemble the composite a little bit. And this is where we're all going to get a little pissed off. Okay. So prepare yourselves. Thanks for the warning. Detectives concluded that such a well-educated, well-adjusted, congenial young man couldn't be responsible for these vicious crimes. End quote. Yep, you're right. Are you pissed off? Fuck yeah, I'm pissed off. I'm pissed off. He was released the next day. Oh my god. So they didn't even like try for no. the DNA? They were just like, oh. He gave them the DNA? So like, a straight white cisgender guy mm -hmm. just assumed another straight white cisgender guy. But what are the odds of that, you know? What are the odds? Who would have thought of a patriarchy in the 1990s of, with white privilege? No way. And, you know, homophobia just rampant. Very unlikely. Just. Ugh. So upon being released, uh, he drove to see his girlfriend, Carla Homolka, um, for a, quote, secret meeting where he uh, insisted to her that he was not the Scarborough rapist. Uh, he moved to her town permanently the following February. And he decided to commit his first rape in this new town on April 6, 1991. His victim this time was 14 years old. Oh, my God. Is that the youngest so far? I believe so. Yep. What year was this? Uh, 1991. Uh, okay. Uh, so just to go a little bit backwards, by 1990, Paul had been spending a lot of time with Carla, his girlfriend's family. Who really liked him. Um, Carla was the oldest daughter. And at this point, by 1990, they, the two were engaged. So I guess Carla was actually his fiance. And was she aware of all of the shit he was doing? Because you said that she encouraged his like sadistic behavior. We shall find out. Oh, no. Okay, just go. So Paul was engaged to Carla, who was the oldest daughter. But he constantly flirted with Tammy, who was the youngest daughter. Oh, my. And at the time, he, he had actually been an accountant, but he didn't tell anyone that he had lost his job and was actually making money by smuggling cigarettes across the U.S.-Canadian border. Mm, okay. So he became obsessed with Tammy, and he would watch her through her window at night, um, and he would go into her room and masturbate while she slept. Get this. Tell me. Carla, his fiance, helped him by breaking the blind so that he could watch through oh, the window no it gets worse so okay basically at this point she broke the blind so that right. he could watch so there'd be a hole from outside in the window yeah mm -hmm. in july uh paul bernardo took tammy across the border into the u.s to get beer for a party uh he later told his fiance that while they were there they got drunk and started making out okay just like a side note, uh, on July 24th, 1990, Carla made spaghetti for her little sister, Tammy. Only she laced it with crushed Valium that she had stolen from the animal clinic where she worked. Mm -hmm. And after Tammy lost consciousness, Carla watched as Paul attempted to rape her. Uh, but fortunately, I guess the meds weren't strong enough, so... Uh, Tammy regained consciousness before they could do anything further. Okay. And after, anything further than rape her? Well, he attempted to rape her, oh, but okay. she okay. regained consciousness before he could. Um, and after this, uh, Paul continued to supply Tammy with, and her friends with gifts, food. And this is something that I don't know if you understand this quote, because I don't understand it, but this is what it says. Uh, he continued to supply Tammy and her friends with gifts, food, and soda that had, quote, a film and a few white flecks on the top. That was his, his quote. I don't know what that means. A film and a few white flecks? Like, he was still spiking it? Oh, maybe. I don't know. What else has a film? It's like a beer? I don't know. I, I didn't get that quote. I would imagine. I don't know. Okay. 
Okay. It's, it's just something He's weird. also crazy, so he, maybe it actually makes no sense. Exactly. Okay, just checking. So, six months before Paul and Carla's wedding, Carla stole an anesthetic called halothane from the animal clinic where she worked. And on December 23rd, 1990, she and Paul put the sleeping pills in a rum and eggnog cocktail and gave it to Tammy to drink. Oh, fuck. Once Tammy was unconscious, they took off her clothes and Carla applied a halothane soaked cloth to her sister's mouth and nose. Okay. (sighs) Apparently, she wanted to give Bernardo a Christmas gift. And the Christmas gift was Tammy's virginity. <gasps> oh, my God. She knew that um, Bernardo, that Paul was angry or upset that when they got together, Carla wasn't a virgin. So to make up for it, she decided to use her little sister's virginity to give it to him. Fuck. As a Christmas gift. Oh, my God. Um, yeah. <sighs> so Tammy's parents were Tammy and Carla's parents were sleeping upstairs. They were in their parents' house. Uh-huh. Carla and Paul filmed themselves as they raped Tammy <gasps> in the basement. They wait, they both did? Both of them. Wait, what? Both of so them. So now there's incest rape. Mm-hmm. Okay. Tammy um began to vomit while she was unconscious. Uh and the two and choked on her vomit and the two tried to revive her. They called 911 after they had hidden all the evidence. Okay. And then moved her into a bedroom. A few hours later, um, Tammy was pronounced dead at the hospital without ever having regained consciousness. Shit. Well, thank God, kind of, you know. I know. If you're going to go through that, wouldn't you rather never know what the fuck happened? It is almost like a, a, I hope she was out cold before any of this happened. But still. Fuck. Yeah. There's a movie about this, isn't there? With Laura Prepon in it. Oh, maybe. I don't know. The girl I, who played Dawn on that 70s show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and she's in... Orange is New Orange Black. Orange is New Black. Yeah. I... There was a... There was honestly, like, a huge section on Wikipedia of, like, pop culture references, so... This was definitely a movie. Okay. All I remember is there was, like, a Law & Order special rape show about this. Oh, really? Yeah. But I... I don't know. I'm sure there's a movie, too. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm pretty sure it's like one of those Lifetime movies. It's the same channel I watched the Sylvia Likens one on. Oh, yeah. Probably. I think we are just... Our podcast is a spinoff of, of the, the Lifetime, Lifetime movies. <laughs> I'm just pretty sure. Uh, Lifetime also airs I Survived, so... Oh. Yeah. Well, then we are just Lifetime. Also, apparently... Who did you say was in the movie? Laura about, Prepon. No, about um, Sylvia Likens. Oh. I thought it was Christina Ricci, but apparently it was someone else. Yeah. It was someone else. A bunch of people wrote me, so we know, we heard you guys. We heard you. We're wrong. We heard you, and we still don't know. Just assume we're wrong. If if you're like, oh, they're wrong. Just assume we know we're wrong. Yeah, we're, <laughs> like we're not. Like we come here every day, and I think you guys think we think we're experts, but we know we're not. <laughs> like we just like Googled something, and we're just talking about it now. We're like, hey, I know this thing, and then we're like, we both look at each other like. We don't no, we don't. This. We don't. <laughs> we don't know what's going on at all. <laughs> a lot of the edits that don't get into the final cut of our episodes are us just being like, "What the fuck are we doing?" <laughs> oh yeah. And also, like, um, <laughs> let me like say it again so that when I respond, I sound more intelligent than I did the first time you said it. Like, I want to respond with him. If only we did that during the Wales England conversation. Oh, oh we didn't. We didn't Google or change anything about our intelligence. Talk about raw but- footage. <laughs> But we sure were confident, damn it. <laughs> we tried our best. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Okay. So after uh, Tammy died, um, Carla and Paul were still doing their weird ass things. Um, apparently they were super weird. They would vacuum and do laundry in the middle of the night. Um, and despite the fact that they were doing all these crazy things and Tammy, her body, she had a chemical burn on her face, um, but the coroner and Tammy's family accepted the story that Carla and Paul told, which is that Tammy had choked on her vomit after consuming too much alcohol. So and, like, her parents never needed, like, proof of a body or, like... No, they had the body, but they just said... Oh, they just believed what they said. Because she had drunk alcohol, and they just said, oh, it was just an accident, you know? Would you like an intermission for me to tell you something you want to hear? What's going on? Okay, so I also just got a Twitter notification. Uh, 
I just, from our Snapchat video earlier of you flipping me off. Yeah. I guess one of our listeners follows me on Snapchat and said, um, how is it that Christine Schieffer is so pretty even when she's flipping someone off and clearly doesn't want to be filmed? Hashtag not fair. Listen, you can see my entire stomach in that video. <laughs> so I will Your very say, pretty stomach, apparently. I was really hoping nobody would ever see that because I'm actually mortified about it. But thank you. That's very Her kind of you. name is Sydney. Sydney, thank you. I didn't mean to like interrupt you. I just, I knew you'd want to hear it. I highly appreciate it. And I also am highly mortified that anybody saw my stomach rolls, but, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> all right. Anyway, keep going with this wonderful God, tale. You guys are so kind and supportive. I love all of you so much. We tell, we say a lot of fucked up things on here for you guys to be so nice to us. I know. There's something wrong with you. Why are you so nice? Why are you so nice? What's the matter with you? Do you need to talk to someone? Do you need help? Don't talk to us. Oh, no, please no. talk to me. Oh, talk to Christine. I need a lot of attention. I have a lot of issues I'm working through. <laughs> talk to M too. <laughs> Maybe I need someone to talk to. Uh, yeah, actually, don't talk to me. Talk to M. <laughs> okay. Um. Ba 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 da. So basically, the coroner was like, "Yep, uh, looks like Tammy choked on her own vomit." Um. Oh, that's what the coroner said. Yep. Yep. <laughs> basically, me, me as a coroner. Yep. Actually, yep. though. Yep. That's me. Uh, the pair, so Paul and Carla started filming themselves uh, with Carla wearing Tammy's clothes and pretending to be Tammy. I'm sorry. Yeah. For what? To like just like put just, on a fucking play for themselves? They would like videotape themselves and watch it. <sighs> uh, they also moved out of the Homoka house and rented a bungalow to let uh, Carla's parents cope with their grief. Which is so gracious of them. Right. You know? The kindest. So kind. So thoughtful. So kind. <laughs> um, so, okay. Fast forward. Early morning, June 15th, 1991. <laughs> oh, my God. Do it. Just do it. Bernardo was on a drive looking to steal license plates. Of course. As you do. That's what I do. That's what I do. When he spotted a 14-year-old girl named Leslie... Mahafe. Okay. She had missed her curfew the night before uh, after attending a funeral. Oh. She was locked out of her house. So, like, her life's already gone pretty bad. So, she's already... She's at a funeral. Or in missing a, a funeral. In a bad place. No, she went to the funeral. And, and then it, got locked out. Yeah, exactly. Um, she hadn't been able to find a place to stay over, so she was locked out of her parents' house. So, Paul approached her and told her he was hoping... Okay, this is weird. It, what isn't at this point? Just go. I know, but this is like... Even more. Just, I just don't get it. He approached her and told her he was hoping to break into a neighbor's house. She wasn't phased what? and asked him if he had any cigarettes. It's weird. It's weird. I don't I get mean, it. I mean, my stupid brain would have been like, oh, if you're like being so open about telling me, I'm going to assume there's like a good reason for it. Which is like, what is what makes me an idiot? Wouldn't you be like, Why? If we're speaking in, like, a realistic situation, if I didn't recognize the person, I would definitely be wary. So I think, yeah, 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 I got you. I got you. But you know what? I mean, whatever. She's 14. She's asking for cigarettes. Who knows? Maybe she was just like... She also just came back from a funeral. Maybe she's a little distraught. She's probably not in a good place. It doesn't matter what she did because it's not her fault. What let's, matters is what happened. Let's just put that out there. Not her fault. It's not this fault. asshole's fault. Uh, so he's like, yeah, I do have cigarettes. So he led her to his car. And while they were walking, he blindfolded her and forced her into the car. Oh, my. He drove her to his and Carla's rented bungalow. And he told Carla they had a new playmate. Oh. Um, the two videotaped themselves torturing and sexually abusing Leslie, all while playing Bob Marley and David Bowie. Which... That... It... <sighs> that detail adds so much creepiness fucked up in this to this whole story especially because those are two types of music that like represent peace and peace. like peace like, i thought not, the same thing it's like those are the least violent fucking things to be listening to if i were this poor girl i could obviously never listen to whatever music never. they were playing again but like never. why would you pick such good music when i read that i just thought of like one love by bob marley yeah. and i was like can you imagine being tortured to that and <sighs> and i mean this is like not the same thing Obviously, but my brother got into a really bad car accident while he was listening to Phil Collins, and it took him like a year to even be able to listen to Phil Collins without being like, "Please turn it off." Because yeah. like he got into a really bad, like went unconscious, like got into a really bad car accident. Yeah, the fact that 
they were playing Bob Marley and David Bowie, which you're right, are like the most unifying. Un- yeah. Ugh. Anyway, so at one point, Paul said to Leslie, quote, you're doing a good job, Leslie, a damned good job. The next two hours are going to determine what I do to you. <gasps> right now, you're scoring perfect. The next day, they killed her. <gasps> Paul claimed Carla fed her a lethal dose of Halcyon, which is that, like, um, thing I told you she stole earlier from uh-huh. the animal clinic. And Carla claimed that Paul had strangled her. But either way, they killed her and put her body in the basement. But then they decided that the best thing to do to hide the evidence would be to dismember the body and encase each piece in cement. So oh my God. he went and bought a shit ton of cement. Then they used uh, his grandfather's circular saw to cut the body. Then they dumped the cement blocks in a nearby lake. Um, but one of the blocks was 200 pounds and they had too much difficulty like moving Lifting it. it yeah. yeah, so they just left it by the shore. And I guess a father and son on a fishing trip like stumbled upon it. Of course. And there's actually photos of police like trying to carry it. Yeah, or like surrounding this like oh, no. giant cement block with like body parts in it. It's really fucked up. Um so June 29th uh which is the day that that cement block was actually discovered was also <laughs> what <sighs> Paul and Carla's wedding day. Oh, good. So sweet. They had an elaborate wedding. It was held at the Niagara on the Lake Church, and apparently Paul was in total control of the wedding plans, and the plans included the two of them riding in on a white horse-drawn carriage. Mm-hmm. Really classy. Yeah, way to class it up. Class it up. And uh, Carla was dressed in a really expensive gown. Um, the guests were served a lavish sit-down meal after the couple exchanged their vows, which included... At Bernardo's insistence, <laughs> Carla vowing to love, honor, and obey. <gasps> no. No. Fucked up. No, no. Can you imagine Blaze being like, you have to say that you obey me in your wedding vows? Well, uh, I guess this is the perfect time then to tell everyone that my mom recently became engaged. Hells to the yeah so i'm about to uh have a stepfather tom who christine met and went to many game shows with in the many that they were visiting too many so christine has, what do you uh what's your opinion of my future father listen tom wore a really great outfit it's called the turkey suit it is called the turkey suit this he is a one of a kind he's one of a kind he's a he's a very kind man he's too be a very good stepfather i think he's like the perfect stepfather material he is very, he's a very much nothing but dad humor, actually. Totally. And he reminds me a lot of my stepfather. So I feel like they'd be Tim, Tom and Tim, Tom and Tim, they'd be good friends. So, um, and I'm sure Linda and Renato would be good friends. So sure. really what we're trying to do is set up a double date. Exactly. And, uh, so yeah, my, my mom also, my mom didn't even tell me like in a, <laughs> she, uh, she texted me, I am now engaged, period. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, oh, breaking news, I guess. Hooray, period. And I actually found out before I read that text, one of my friends who listens to the show, Caroline, I found out through a Snapchat video Nuh-uh. of her. I think she was drunk. And she's zooming in and out on my mom's ring going, hello, hello. Oh, shut the fuck up. And then she shows my mom's face and goes, and that's why we drink. And my mother goes, she- and that's why we drink. Wait, are you kidding? That was the video. I, it was a snap video, so I couldn't fuck, save you it. you can't save it. I know. But that's how I found out my mom was engaged. And then I saw her text. And I am now engaged. Could there be a more perfect way to find out? No. 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 I, I totally stole your thunder there, but. No, that's precious. We were talking about weddings I, anyway. I don't know how we didn't even talk about that earlier but i'm so happy for linda congratulations linda if you're listening i don't know if you listen anymore but con- i don't know if she does but congrats she's a soon to be married woman now oh you guys could hey linda have wedding plans together i was literally about to say linda, she can, you know what she's gonna do we're both engaged hashtag i'm the bride hashtag i'm the bride linda hashtag we're the bride oh we're the brides wow wow this is a beautiful moment. my mother and my best friend are Bride to bees together. What a beautiful time it is for you, Em. I can't wait. Oh, that was a nice face. (laughs) 
<laughs> Thank God I got a girlfriend right in time to like be ready for both of your weddings. But though. actually, I was about to have to go stag to a lot of places. Anyway, there we go. Back to Carla. So Carla had to obey her new husband is the point of the story. On April 16th, 1992, uh, Bernardo and Homolka were driving around town looking for potential victims. Mm hmm. As you do. They passed a Catholic school and they spotted a 15 year old student named Kristen French. who was walking quickly back to her home quickly. Indeed. I'm sure. Which was nearby um, because she always walked home from school. Right. She always walked home right after school because she had to take care of her dog. You got to bring a dog into this, Christine. I know it really fucked me up. And she was on her way home when they pulled into a parking lot. Fuck. Carla got out of the car with a map and asked for help with directions. Fuck. So Kristen walked over and looked at the map. And while she was looking at the map, Paul came at her from behind with a knife, forced her into their car. It happened to be a uh, good Friday. So over Easter weekend, Paul and Carla videotaped themselves as they tortured, raped and sodomized her. <gasps> They forced her to drink large quantities of alcohol and be submissive to Bernardo. And then while Paul was out buying pizza, a woman named Carrie Patrick, whom he had stalked the previous month, he had stalked her and her sister, spotted him and was like, oh, my God, that's the guy who was stalking me. So she reported it to police, uh, but unfortunately, the report was mishandled and went into what the judge later called a, quote, black hole. Um, so Kristen French, the little girl, was not rescued. Fuck. Because they that's nice. put the report somewhere. Nobody followed up on it and went to the, quote, black hole. Ugh. That's why I'm saying the stalking thing. It's like people don't take it seriously. And it's like people don't take it seriously. They don't take... We just need any sort of relationship abuse, whether or not you're in a relationship with that person, is horrible. The target, be, like targeting, you don't know what it's like until it's happening to you, and it's yeah. fucking horrible. And targeting vulnerable people is not okay. No. Um. So anyway, the report was mishandled. Kristen French unfortunately was not rescued, and um, the next day, Paul and Carla murdered Kristen French before they went to Carla's family's house for Easter dinner. Oh, right, of course. Carla said, later, said Paul had strangled Kristen for exactly seven minutes while she watched. And Paul said that Carla had beaten Kristen with a rubber mallet because she tried to escape. And that she actually ended up dying because she was strangled on a noose tied around her neck that was secured to a hope chest. Oh, my God. Then, he said, Carla went to fix her hair before dinner. Authorities found Kristen's body in a ditch on April 30th, 1992, which was about 45 minutes away from where they lived. This is, again, similar to last week. It's sort of like a timeline. But at right. the time, nobody really knew that they were the ones who were to blame for all right, this. Right, right, right. So next up, here we go. It goes on. Uh, Carla had worked at a pet shop uh, two years earlier where she had befriended a then 15-year-old girl who later on was referred to as Jane Doe to protect her identity. So in like trials and things like that, they right. never released her name. Thank God. Yeah. It, yeah. Um, so two years later, two years after she had met her working at the pet store, uh, Carla Hamolka invited Jane Doe for a girl's night out. They shopped and had dinner and then went to um, Hamolka and Bernardo's home. Carla gave Jane alcohol, which she drank. But uh, Jane did not know that Carla had laced it with Halcyon, which is that same yeah, 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 the animal sleeping stuff. pill. Yeah, tranquilizer. Um, and so once Jane had passed out, Carla called Paul and said, your wedding gift is ready. <gasps> no. Right. So Paul came over, um, took off Jane's clothes and... Paul videotaped Carla raping Jane <gasps> before Paul himself raped her both vaginally and anally. Oh, my God. The next morning, Jane woke up and felt nauseous, but thought that her vomiting was because it was the first time she'd ever drank alcohol. Oh, no. So she didn't know why she was in pain and she just thought it was from drinking. OK, but also I'm kind of happy for her. It. Yeah. Like, thank God. She ended up coming back two more times. 
No. I know. No. The same, a similar thing happened the next time, and then the third time, apparently. So like she would just wake up, and they'd be like all happy, la di da, like, oh, it was so great having you. Bye. We were so drunk. Ha ha. Yep. And then the third time, I guess Carla tried to be like have sex with Paul, and she was like, ew, like I'm uncomfortable, and left. And that was like the third time, and that was it. So they didn't kill her, but um, yeah, they raped her twice. Fuck. Ugh. Okay. So these are the, basically, these are the stories that they know about, that they're convicted of. There's a whole, again, there's a whole list of potential victims, but I'm just going to say a couple of them that, like, seem to be likely. Um, so shortly after Tammy, the younger sister's funeral, uh, her parents left town and the house was empty. So according to one author who had researched Bernardo and um, Homolka, mm-hmm. apparently Bernardo abducted a girl, took her to the house, raped her while Homolka watched, and then dropped her off on a deserted road near the lake. And Bernardo and Homolka took to calling her January Girl. So they just like referred to, as, referred to her as January Girl, which is just, I thought that was so fucked up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, on April 6, 1991, at about 5.30 a.m., Bernardo abducted a 14-year-old who was warming up as a coxswain for a local rowing team. The girl noticed a blonde woman waving at her from her car, a.k.a. Carla, mm-hmm. got distracted. So uh, Paul Bernardo grabbed her and dragged her into the shrubbery. He assault- sexually assaulted her, forced her to remove her clothes, and then wait- forced her to wait five minutes um, while they drove away, basically. Oh, shit. And then Bernardo was also tied to the murder of Elizabeth Bain, who disappeared on June 19th, 1990. Um, and Bain had told her mother that she was going to check the tennis schedule at the University of Toronto Scarborough. And three days later, her car was found with a large blood stain in the back seat, and she was never seen again. Oh, my God. Oh, I, all I can say is, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I know. In December 1992, the police finally tested... Remember how they took, remember how he willingly gave DNA samples Mm -hmm. two years ago? They finally tested them? So they were like, maybe we should test these. Oh my God. Does that not piss you off to no end? Yes. Yes, it does. On December 27th, Bernardo beat Himolka severely. He beat her on the limbs, head and face with a flashlight, a heavy flashlight. Fuck. That's a, that's a tough beating. It's rough. Um, And apparently, I haven't said this, but apparently he had been like physically abusive toward her from day one which i guess isn't very shocking but no. is also like another case, another fact of the case um so she returned to work on january 4th of 1993 and claimed she'd been in a car accident her co-workers were skeptical and called her parents who literally had to physically remove her from the house to get her away Um, apparently she ran back into the house and was frantically searching for something, but her parents took her to St. Catherine's General Hospital, where she gave a statement that she was a battered spouse and she filed charges against Bernardo. So he was arrested, but then they later released him because, you know, why not? So there was this task force that was like basically designated to capture him or like, uh, solve these mysteries. Right. Okay, so they were closing in on Bernardo and Homolka. They fingerprinted her and questioned her. Um, they noticed that she had a Mickey Mouse watch. And the watch looked basically exactly like the one that Kristen French was wearing when she disappeared. Oh, so no. dumbass woman was wearing the same Mickey Mouse watch. That's like someone killing you and then wearing your weird baby pedophile watch. It's... Exactly. I have no other words than... <laughs> exactly. Correct. Exactly. Because yeah. if I ever... If you ever died and then I saw someone wearing that little fucking watch you've had since you were six years old, I'd yeah. be like, oh, you killed Christine. Does anybody know about that pedophile watch? Have we talked about we it? Brought it? We brought it up one time. Oh, People okay. People who are just listening think you literally have a pedophile watch. Well, I mean, it kind of... Okay. It, okay. It's, <laughs> it's not a pedophile Save your watch. tracks. Mm-hmm. Cover your tracks. Cover your tracks. I want to say it's not, but... Christine has a watch full of weird, smiling babies all over a lot of them are crying though like on the face of the watch on the wrist bracelet part of the watch it's like it was trendy in the 90s 
Okay, just kidding. No, it wasn't. <laughs> okay, uh, basically, she learned that during she learned during questioning that Bernardo was identified as the Scarborough rapist, and she kind of freaked out, obviously. But also, is it really like? an obviously kind of thing like how is she not surprised i don't know but again like who knows how to read i mean i know how is she not surprised but also how do you murder a bunch of young women you know, I know. your own little sister so it's I like know, how right. do you even rationalize like, any of what it? do you mean the man who i helped rape my little sister is it, it, actually a rapist and we're gonna get caught right, right. <laughs> So um, she realized they were going to get caught, basically. And instead of con- confessing to police, she confessed to her uncle that huh? uh, Bernardo was a serial rapist and murderer. Wow, she okay. also got a lawyer. And the lawyer, <laughs> fun fact, the lawyer she got was actually um, a man whose Dalmatian she had taken care of when she worked in at the like animal Yeesh. hospital. Awkward. And I guess she had taken really good care of the Dalmatian, so she asked him to be her lawyer. So he was her lawyer. Just weird fact. That that lawyer is also an idiot. Uh, no, not really, because he got her a great fucking deal. Shut up. You'll find out. In mid February, uh, Paul Bernardo was arrested and charged with the Scarborough rapes and the murder of Mahaffey and French. During the search of their home, um, a diary of Paul Bernardo's was discovered with written descriptions of each crime that he had committed. Oh. So it's not even like they were trying to hide them if they ever got caught. Uh, They also found video, like hundreds of videos, like home taped videos of the rapes, the assaults uh, of Carla, like having like weird violent sex with other women, just like really aggressive stuff basically um so then they started to discuss a plea bargain for carla and they decided she would get a 12-year sentence for her uh, participation in the crimes in exchange for her full testimony uh the government agreed that she would be eligible for parole after serving three years (gasps) of good behavior what a oh my god she quickly agreed obviously to all terms and the deal was set uh, later, after all of the evidence was in, the plea bargain became known as being one of the worst in the history of Canada. Yeah, right. With the government accused of making a deal with the devil, which is the way that can- right. like Canadian papers and stuff described it was deal with the devil. Um, Hamoka always portrayed herself as an abused wife who was forced into participating in um, her husband's criminal activity. And it wasn't until they found several videotapes um, of the two of them that it became clear that she was basically enjoying herself the whole time and was like a a huge integral part of all the torture and rape and abuse. Um, So her involvement kind of came to light, but at that point... They had already made the deal. Yeah, deal was the deal. So it was like she couldn't be retried for the same crimes. So um, Bernardo, on the other hand, received a life sentence on September 1st, 1995. Um... Homolka, at the same time, there were photos that surfaced of her sunbathing and partying with other prisoners um, in Canadian newspapers. Was one of them the guy from last week? Uh, literally, it reminded me of the exact same story. Because, I mean, did she have her Versace and that's why we drink shirt? Her and, like, casual Versace wear? Right. <laughs> <laughs> literally, though, it was like... And weren't they related? They were married for a while. You're just believing the fake rumors that he started. Oh, the fake rumors. Right. On I'm the totally a be- Obviously, he... Totally a believer in the tabloids. Tricked you into his own... <laughs> he got me. Um. So, there were also rumors... Tabloids reported that she was in a lesbian relationship with... A woman named Christina Sherry, who was a convicted child rapist. But it was later determined that her lesbian lover was not Sherry, but Linda Verano, who was convicted of participating in a bank robbery. Okay. So I guess that's a little better. Sure. On July 4th, 2005, Homolka was released from prison. Perfect. These are some of the restrictions that they placed on her as a condition of her release. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to tell you them. She has to provide police with her home address, work address, and whomever she lives with. Um, She has to notify police of any change to her name. She is forbidden to contact Paul Bernardo, the families of Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French, or that of the woman known as Jane Doe, or any violent criminals whatsoever. Right. She is forbidden to be with anyone under the age of 16. 
Uh, As you should be. I mean, yeah. Forbidden from taking drugs other than prescription medicine. She's required to continue therapy and counseling um, and required to provide police with a DNA sample. So this is an interesting thing I found. Carla's safety became sort of a concern for her lawyer because he found out that there was an internet death pool. Oh, shit. Where people were taking bets on what day Carla Homolka would be killed. Oh, fuck. So apparently she discovered while in prison uh, two websites. I'm sorry, at least two or three websites that contained threats against her, including this betting pool. So one site was called, quote, Carla Homolka death pool. When the game is over, we all win, end quote. And the site, like, literally said it doesn't condone violence against her, but they, but, they want bets on what, what day she'll die. Just instant death. Yeah. And the strongest bets were for June and July of 2001, which didn't happen. But uh, the, uh, the rules also, there were very strict rules, by the way. Mm. They also said players are not allowed to fix the bet by killing her themselves or have a, having someone else do it. <laughs> so you can't be like it'll happen tomorrow okay i mean it like i'll, shiv her I'll to show death. you tomorrow when i kill her myself in right. the shower right um so homoka who used the alias carla teal in prison was very concerned but again she got out in 2005 so she was fine um one other last thing bernardo apparently scored 35 out of 40 on the psychopathy checklist which is pretty damn high holy shit which um, is a psychological assessment tool used to assess the presence of psychopathy in individuals. And it, so he is classified as a clinically psychopath. And in November 2015, Bernardo published his own piece of literature. Jesus Christ. Of course he did. Called what? A Mad World Order, which is a violent fictional 631 page ebook on holy crap amazon by november 15th the book was reportedly an amazon bestseller but was quietly removed from the website due to a public outcry Mm, you don't say so anyway these mofos she got off easy she got off way easy there were videos of her torturing these young women and girls she just hid them long enough to make a good deal she just kind of played the card and and abused the whole power of like being in a submissive fuck position so <sighs> no no but it's interesting to think like that that woman is the one that the guy I talked about last week and he was so desperate to start rumors about being mm-hmm. with her luca magnato was for years yeah. spreading rumors online that he and her were in a serious relationship which it makes no sense it, no. not knowing her story. She no. was definitely in another serious relationship. It's wild. And by serious, I mean like seriously fucked up. Serious and seriously fucked up. As in they were murdering people together. Wow. So it was just a weird... It's like uh, a weird serial killer family yeah. tree. Yeah. So I thought that was kind of a weird branch off. But um, yeah, so that's that. Well, what the fuck am I supposed to do now? Hey, at least no kittens were killed this week. Valid. Also, if you guys do want to see it, I did check it out, and there is a movie with Laura Prepon, and it's called Carla. Carla with a K, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's just called Carla. Oh, okay. And it's uh, Donna from That 70s Show. What's her name? Alex on Orange? Yeah. Orange is New Black? Alex, yeah. Um, so if you see her face on the cover that's the movie i was thinking of that's the one and it's just as fucked up as lifetime can make it so nice get it from your local blockbuster oh now that's also why i drink now because blockbuster has been dead for quite some time blaze worked at blockbuster (gasps) for years no way isn't that hilarious that he could literally tell his children about that and they'll be like what the fuck i say that that all the time i'm like our grandchildren will not know what the fuck you're talking about they're gonna be like what do you mean like i I don't even know how you explain that to someone now. It's like, well, before Netflix, you had to go bring your car somewhere to get a movie and then you could rent it. And it was a special occasion. It was like, if you were lucky, a Friday night for a sleepover, all of you had to pick two movies and then you had to rewind them and then you had to bring it back with your car, drive it somewhere and drop them off like a 
It, like a library. Like it was a plebeian. It was a, like a library of movies. What was the first DVD you ever bought? Um, it was uh, Spy Kids. Oh, that's a good one. But it was also uh, one of my closest friends growing up as part of like a, like their parents were uh, pilots and flight attendants and all that. So their whole family would regularly have like international trips. Yeah. Because they were flight attendants. So anytime their mom went to China, she would just go get a bunch of bootleg DVDs. My dad did that, but he didn't do it the right way. She knew all the good black market bootleg DVDs. So my first DVD was Spy Kids in Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I think that was that was it. As I said in a past, well, I guess it was a Patreon, uh, like a blooper reel. I think it was a blooper reel episode. But my dad would go to China and buy like a bootleg CD ROMs for us. And it was like Aladdin, but it wasn't Aladdin. It was like Magic Boy on the carpet. Right. Yes. Like it was all fake. I got that too. They got me, um, when we were older, they got me the DVD for Knocked Up. Which was also in Chinese, and it wasn't called Knocked Up. It was, oops, I'm pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, like, arguably a better title. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, so thanks, guys, for listening. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed Lisa being on the show. I know she kind of bailed early, but she's three hours ahead, so. She also has a life and a more important job than us. So. As she told you, she's very important and very famous. Very important. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, if you do want to catch her... Um, her mm-hmm. new podcast is coming out it's on iTunes, on uh, Feral Audio. It's called Get Stuffed. And, uh, yeah. You guys, thanks for listening. We love you guys so much. Um, and uh, thank you guys for the uh, coming to the live event, to the Patreon donators who were... So fun. Thank you guys for coming to our Facebook Live little get-together this weekend. You guys asked some really cool questions. We're going to come at you soon with another episode. And um, if you want to check us out, you can go to andthatswhywedrink.com to submit any stories you want to submit. Or you can also email them to andthatswhywedrink at gmail.com. You can find us on social media at ATWWD Podcast on just about any social media. And you can also get merch at andthatswhywedrink.bigcartel.com. We love you guys. Thank you for listening. And And that's that's why why we we drink. drink. God, we're getting so good. I know.